Um, welcome. My name is Jody Jindal. I am the editor in chief of the Duke Law Journal, and thank you all for joining us for the 46th annual Administrative Law Symposium um, Intellectual Property Exceptionalism in Administrative Law. Before we get started, I just have a few thank yous to deliver. Um, first and foremost, to Seth Lowinger. Um, he's the special projects editor. Uh, he's actually just back there handling things as usual. And you must have gotten a lot of emails over from him over the last few months, but he's been so incredibly helpful and I would not, this just would not have come together without his help. There have been so many times when I have had an email to send and I'm like, Seth, have, have we done this yet? And he'll just say, nope, it's already done and I just don't have to worry about it. And it's been such a huge help. Um, thank you also to the members of the Duke Law Journal, especially Tim Singer and Michael Fishman, um, who are the lead articles editors on the symposium. And, probably the ones you've communicated with the most. Um, Christy Compost, our journals coordinator, um, who has just helped with a lot of the logistics here. The media department, who's organized the recordings. The events department, who've organized um, the space that we're in today. Professor Benjamin, who's always and available and free with his advice. Uh, the Duke faculty, who are agreeing to serve as moderators, and especially Professor Burstein, who is here just as a guest, and we've successfully roped him in to our craziness. And then finally, to Professor Wasserman, who has served as the point person for the proposal. Um, she wrote the proposal, and we were so excited when we received it. I remember when I was reading it, and I came across that phrase, intellectual property exceptionalism in administrative law, and I was struck by it. I had no idea what it meant. And I'm so <laughs> excited today um, to find out what it means. So thank you. And with that, I'll hand it over. Um, I just want to start, of course, by thanking Duke Law Journal and all the members, and in particular, uh, Seth, for all the hard work and um, organizing this conference and pulling it uh, together. Um, and I think it's a really exciting time to think about the sort of intersection of administrative law and intellectual property, right? Both this sort of first question, should standard administrative law principles apply to intellectual property? And if it should, then what does it look like? Especially, I think, in light of um, recent congressional action and Supreme Court action that's elevated the role of the PTO um, through a host of different uh, proceedings, including the new adjudicatory powers that's going to be the subject of our first panel. Um, and I would be remiss if I just didn't say how excited I am about the lineup today. Uh, Rochelle Dreyfus um, actually taught me patent law when I was at NYU um, and has been writing about the sort of institutions of the Fed Circuit and the PTO since the Federal Circuit's inception. We have Artie Rye and Stuart Benjamin, who I really, and as well, along with John Golden, who I see really is writing the sort of first seminal articles of taking administrative law seriously um, in uh, the PTO. And then we have a whole sort of a slew of, I think, of second generational uh, scholars, including Jonathan, Safna, uh, myself, um, that have really a thought uh, as well about administrative law and IP. So I'm really um, excited to be part of this conference today. Oh, well, Michael's the moderator, actually. Oh, 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 so, so oh, Michael is, is the... <laughs> I'll do uh, just a, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Burstein. I'm a professor at Cardozo Law School in New York City, uh, where I teach patent law, uh, among other subjects. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. So thanks to the editors of the Duke Law Journal for the symposium and for including me. Thanks to Melissa for putting on a terrific event. Um, so this first panel is going to feature papers by... by and Stuart Benjamin uh, and by John Golden. Uh, what we're going to do is have uh, Artie and Stuart present their paper first, uh, then John will talk about his, uh, and then we'll have discussion from Chris Walker uh, for Artie and Stuart's paper and from Sapna Kumar uh, for John's paper. Um, so very briefly, uh, we'll start with uh, Professor Rye and Professor Benjamin, who should be familiar to everybody here. Uh, Artie is the Elvin R. Lottie Professor of Law and the co-director of the Duke Law Center for Innovation Policy. Uh, 
Stewart is the Douglas B. Maggs Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Research, and also the other co-director uh, of the Duke Law Center for Innovation Policy. Uh, Professor Rye's career spans academia, government, service, and practice, and crosses multiple areas of law, policy, and science. She's the author of over 50 articles, books, and essays on IP, administrative law, and health policy, which have been published both in law journals and in peer-reviewed publications in other fields. Uh, from 2009 to 2010, she served as the administrator of the Office of External Affairs at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, where she led policy analysis of the patent reform legislation that ultimately became the AIA, about which we'll talk uh, in great detail today. She continues regularly to testify before Congress and other administrative bodies about IP law. She's a member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, the American Law Institute, and co-chair of the IP Committee of the ABA Section on Administrative Law. Professor Rye graduated from Harvard with a degree in biochemistry and history. She has a JD from Harvard Law School, and she's taught at the University of San Diego and the University of Pennsylvania before coming to Duke. Professor Benjamin's research focuses on telecommunications, the First Amendment, and administrative law. He's the author of the leading casebook in the field of telecommunications, as well as numerous articles, one of which I had the great privilege of editing when I was a law journal editor uh, back at NYU. Uh, from 2009 to 2011, he was the first distinguished scholar at the Federal Communications Commission, where he continues to serve as an, in an advisory role. His government experience also includes time in the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ and clerking for Justice Souter. Uh, Professor Benjamin has a BA and a JD, both from Yale. Uh, John Golden will be our sort of second paper presenter. Uh, John is the Loomer Professor in Law at the University of Texas at Austin Law School. John's taught administrative law, contracts, patent law, and seminars relating to innovation and intellectual property policy. Uh, since 2011, he served as the faculty director of the Andrew Ben White Center in Law, Science, and Social Policy. And his research focuses primarily on innovation policy, institutional design, patents, and remedies. John has a PhD in physics from Harvard. There we go. Physics in action. <laughs> John has a PhD in physics from Harvard, uh, a JD from Harvard, and an AB in physics and history from Harvard. Uh, before joining the faculty at the University of Texas, he clerked for Judge Boudin of the First Circuit and then for Justice Breyer at the Supreme Court. He's also spent some time in private practice, and we're delighted to have him here today. Um, our two commentators are Chris Walker, who's Assistant Professor of Law uh, at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Uh, Chris teaches civil procedure, constitutional litigation, legislation, and state and local government law. His research focuses on the intersection among these fields. He uh, writes about administrative law, regulation, and law and policy at the agency level in particular. Prior to joining the faculty at OSU, uh, Chris clerked for Justice Kennedy of the Supreme Court and Judge Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit and worked in private practice in Washington, DC. Uh, Chris also was involved in the ABA section on administrative law. He's a council member and the co-chair of the adjudication committee. He has a BA from BYU, a master's in public policy from Harvard, and a JD from Stanford. Uh, and then finally, Sapna Kumar is a professor at the University of Houston School of Law, where she teaches administrative law, uh, property, and patent law. And she is an expert on the application of administrative law to the patent system, with a particular emphasis on the International Trade Commission. Uh, Pat, uh, Sapna has a JD from the University of Chicago, uh, She's practiced intellectual property litigation in Chicago at Kirkland & Ellis. Uh, she spent two years here at Duke, where she was a faculty fellow and part of the Center for Genome Ethics, Law, and Policy, uh, and clerked for Judge Kenneth Ripple on the Seventh Circuit. So with that, I will turn it over to Artie and Stuart. So while Artie's getting up, I just want to say, um, the editing experience I had with Michael at NYU was one of the truly great editing experiences. No, I'm serious. I've always been following his Very career kind. since then, because he actually, he, he, like he asked, Really, really great questions. Really helped uh, uh, sharpen the paper. So it's, it's it's actually for me, it's actually a great pleasure to meet Michael after so many years because you. you actually made my work better, which is a great thing. It was an honor. Wow. Well, <laughs> uh, that's a wonderful place uh, to begin. So the title of Stewart's and my paper is administrative power in the era of patent stare decisis. And that, too, is a perhaps enigmatic title, but we hope to explain what it means in what follows. I will talk for the first half or so of our presentation, and Stuart will follow with the second half. So historically, 
you know, given the title of the symposium, uh, it's obvious that most, uh, many practitioners and certainly um, uh, many judges have treated the Patent and Trademark Office and patent law in general as outside the purview of ordinary administrative law. So in 2007, Stuart and I wrote an article called Who's Afraid of the APA? What the Patent System Can Learn from Administrative Law that argued the patent law is not an exception, so you can tell what our position on that subject is, <laughs> and that the application of ordinary administrative law principles is doctrinally appropriate and normatively desirable. So we're really gratified, needless to say, for, that this symposium is happening, and that at least some people think that, at a minimum, patent exceptionalism is a little bit peculiar. Whether you think it's justified or not, it's a little bit peculiar. Uh, whether outside of academia that's the case, I'm not sure. It's not necessarily clear, and this is the burden of our paper, that courts, including the Supreme Court, will agree that patent law exceptionalism is peculiar. Um, uh, they, and that's what we're going to be talking about in part. So we think that it's time to revisit this issue, not simply because the Supreme Court has been doing some odd stuff, we think, in the area of administ at the intersection of administrative and patent law, but also because, as Melissa pointed out, the PTO has gotten a lot more power recently. The AIA gives it a very significant amount of power through the creation of the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or PTAB, and we are very fortunate to have the former chief judge of the PTAB, the inaugural chief judge who really built the PTAB in our audience here, um, James Smith, um, who I should note is a Duke Law grad, so. Uh, <laughs> so all credit goes to Duke, right? Um, so obviously uh, the PTAB has a fair amount of power to resolve errors in patent grants outside the courts, and that's why it was created. The idea, as we'll discuss in a minute, is that, that courts are probably not the best way to resolve, at least as an initial matter, errors, any errors that might have arisen through the initial patent grant. So the PTAB receives a lot of petitions. It's uh, the second most popular forum after the Eastern District of Texas, and as we probably know there's a case involving PTAP procedures, Quozo versus Lee, now at the Supreme Court. So all very hot stuff and very exciting. So we thought it was a pretty good time to review uh, admit the intersection of administrative law and patent law in the context of the PTAP. So we're going to talk both about black letter administrative law and about strategic considerations. We don't currently, because we talk so much about normative considerations in our 2007 article, we don't currently do so, but as a normative matter, as you know, as I've already said, we think that ordinary administrative law should apply. So um, what we say in this paper is that as a descriptive matter, the executive branch, including the PTO, has been relatively assertive in certain respects, but perhaps curiously resistant in others. So on the one hand, the PTO has aggressively asserted lack of judicial reviewability with respect to certain types of PTAB decisions, particularly decisions to initiate post-grant proceedings. And it's also argued for Chevron deference with respect to lots of different decisions it has made in structuring pro, uh, PTAB proceedings. And as Rochelle Dreyfus, among others, has pointed out, um, their final decisions, the PTAB's final decisions on validity, actually do stake out some interesting ground in parsing the complex requirements of patent validity. So it's not as if the PTAB um, has been a potted plant by any stretch of the imagination. That said, as we pointed out in our paper, we think that the P uh, PTO has not necessarily structured ultimate decision making in a way that would put it in the strongest position to ask for Chevron deference on substantive validity issues. And in fact, the PTO and the executive branch more generally have not asked for Chevron deference on substantive validity issues. So our paper is largely descriptive uh, in the sense that it wants to think about what explains this behavior. Um, we think, in contrast to John Golden, to prefigure his paper a little bit, that the administrative law could lead the PTO to put itself into that strong position, or the, the relevant administrative law does allow for the PTO to put itself in that strong position. Um, but we also think, and this, hence the title of our paper, that the Supreme Court may not be amenable 
to that sort of argument, even though as a black letter matter, the argument may work as a matter of recent Supreme Court decision making in this arena, they seem to be less interested in administrative law than in principles of stare decisis that really predate the administrative state. So it may be the Supreme Court is interested in patent exceptionalism, and that's a hypothesis we want to explore. So I'll just start with a quick background on the PTAB and then talk about what the executive branch has and has not done with respect to asserting administrative power. Then Stuart will talk about the ways in which recent decisions by the Supreme Court tend to, we think, deprioritize ordinary administrative law. And Stuart will also talk about how those Supreme Court decisions may have had some impact as a realist matter on what the executive branch, um, including but not limited to the PTO, also including DOJ, have decided to do. Um, that's obviously speculation, but, but we think it's interesting speculation. So I'm not going to talk too much about background on the PTAB. I suspect many of you probably know the background. But the basic idea for setting up the PTAB was Article III litigation is incredibly costly. And it doesn't necessarily yield great accuracy either, because the area is an incredibly complex area scientifically. Um, all, all, a lot of the proxies that patent validity doctrine uses are science-based, and so it's very complex. And last but not least, also, um, the cost creates certain collective action problems that we can talk about uh, in Q&A if people are interested, um, but that's been written about before, so we just refer to the earlier literature, collective action problems in terms of challenging bad patents. So the idea is that if the AIA proceedings could lower the cost of challenging bad patents in addition to making the challenge, the adjudicators of the challenges more expert, that would all be a good thing. And so the AIA created three different post-grant proceedings, and we're going to talk mostly about inter partes review, which is the most uh, prominent of these proceedings, although covered business method patent review has also been uh, pretty prominent. So um, for a variety of reasons, as you probably know, challengers like the PTAB, it's not, it, in part, it's that they think it's an expert adjudicatory forum. The judges are really smart, and I'm not just saying that because James Smith is here. <laughs> um, I've, I've talked to many practitioners, not really people even, people who are defending their patents before the pre-tab, and nobody has told me that they don't think the judges are smart. Everyone agrees. And this is actually a remarkable personnel feat in and of itself because hiring really, really smart people in government is not always easy. And so, you know, it's something that, that I think is worth noting in and of itself. Uh, but in addition, you know, the PTAB has specifically under the AAA a lower threshold for invalidating patent claims. So they use a preponderance of the evidence standard as opposed to clear and convincing evidence in the courts. And that's explicitly baked into the AIA. So that's what Congress said. Um, in addition, and more controversial, because, and also the subject of the Quozo case now at the Supreme Court, is what is their way of interpreting claims in patent cases um, that may make it easier to invalidate patents at the PTAB than in district courts, the so-called broadest reasonable interpretation. OK, so that's all by way of background um, in terms of why the PTAB is attractive to challengers. And it sees lots of petitions uh, as a consequence. So what has the PTO done? Well, it's repeatedly asked for Chevron deference with respect to various procedural aspects of its proceedings. So these include invocation of the BRI standard and the Quozo case in which um, they've invoked the BRI standard is a case in which they specifically asked for Chevron deference. And the, the Federal Circuit, as a secondary argument, agreed that Chevron deference was due, although that was not their primary argument. And um, at the Supreme Court, presumably, this issue will be raised. Um, They've asked for Chevron deference with respect to their decision to allow institution and final decisions to be made by the same panel. So that was the Ethicon case where the uh, Federal Circuit, and all these opinions seem to go to Judge Dyke, which is sort of interesting, um, uh, agreed that Chevron deference was due. And then most recently in Synopsis, um, uh, uh, also, um, they asked for Chevron deference on institutions and only a subset of challenge claims. So, so pretty assertive stuff on procedural aspects of, of the proceedings. 
Uh, as I've mentioned, also pretty assertive on saying judicial review is just not available for the initial decision to institute a proceeding. And, went so far as to say that it's not available ever, even after the final decision has been made. Now, the Federal Circuit didn't agree with that, and I think reasonable minds can differ on that question, but that's a pretty assertive position to take. And then in the context of CBM, the PTO has asserted its prerogative to define the scope of what constitutes a covered business method patent. And I think it's fair to say push the envelope a little bit in terms of how it interprets Section 101 on patentable subject matter in the context of CBM proceedings. Uh, Rochelle Dreyfus has pointed out in a recent article that more generally, not just in the context of 101, but more generally, the PTAB has taken something of a leadership position in interpreting uh, questions such as definiteness and obviousness, these kinds of requirements of the patent statute that are, need lots of clarification still. So it might seem obvious in some ways that PTO would argue for deference to some of these substantive validity positions, but it hasn't so argued. John Golden, and again, I don't want to preempt his talk in any way, um, suggests that this is probably for the obvious reason that they don't necessarily, the PTO doesn't necessarily have the power to render a decision that should receive Chevron deference on, with respect to substantive issues. We're not so sure. So I'll talk about this a little bit, and then we can probably get into it in the Q&A as well. So the relevant case here for both of us, for both John and our article, is Mead. Mead emphasized that one of the test zones is formality and rigor, and I think we would all agree, based upon some of the great work that Melissa has done, um, that these proceedings are pretty formal and rigorous. I mean, Melissa went through in her 2013 William & Mary article regarding all the all the curlicues in these proceedings, and I think that most people would agree they satisfy the form formality and rigor requirements. So that's necessary, but not necessarily sufficient, and we agree um, that it may be that we need other indicia of whether the PTAB has been given, or the PTO more generally, has been given authority to make decisions that have, quote unquote, the force of law under Mead. Um, so, in most agencies, and John points this out, um, as does Melissa, I believe, in her 2013 paper, um, formal adjudications are conducted by administrative law judges who are then reviewed by agency heads. And in the PTAB, we don't have administrative law judges. We have so-called administrative judges. I, I don't think that moniker makes that much of a difference, but the key difference that may be relevant is the fact that ALJ, the AJ decisions, excuse me, um, in the PTAB are not under the terms of the AIA explicitly reviewed by the agency director, the PTO director. So the AIA doesn't say, and the director shall review these decisions, which is often the case in other organic statutes that, that uh, provide for formal adjudication. But we, point out, first of all, that Mead didn't specifically address that issue. And there's a circuit split, as it turns out, on that issue. Um, although it may be that the those who would argue that you do need the agency director formally to be able to have plenary power to review the decision have the better argument. As uh, Tom Merrill and Crystal and Hickman pointed out a while ago, and many of the circuits have gone with their argument. So, um, fair enough. So maybe the agency director does need to have the power to say, nope, you got it wrong, to the PTAB. Even so, we think that the director may have that power. And in the article, we go into, in some detail, the reasons why we think the director may have that power. First of all, the director does have authority and needs to be consulted as a sine qua non in order for an opinion to be declared precedential. So for precedential opinion, we think that the argument for the director playing an active role is pretty clear. And those should be presumably sorts of decisions that might well be fall even within the more stringent Merrill Hickman view of what constitutes decision-making with the force of law, quote-unquote. Um, 
Then, and this is perhaps a more radical proposal, we also think that even if those presidential decisions don't have enough of the imprimatur of the director, and maybe because the way the presidential decisions are rendered is not explicitly set out in the statute, um, maybe the director doesn't have the authority to 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 have to be the but for kind of um, gatekeeper for those presidential decision presidential decisions. We do look to see in the statute where the director explicitly has authority, and that is in the context of rehearing. So the director does have the authority to expand the panel when a panel renders a decision um, and put on the expanded panel her, and it is her now, um, her political deputies. Um, and so um, in that sense, we do think that the director ultimately does have the power. And um, the issue actually has been litigated. It was litigated in a case called In Re Allipat back in 1994. And the Federal Circuit, we would argue, agreed with us that in that case, the director basically stacked the panel with his political deputies and reversed the decision of what was the predecessor to the PTAB and said that um, uh, you know, that was the decision of the PTO. The issue was appealed, and one of the questions was whether um, the director had the power to do this, and the Federal Circuit said yes. Uh, so we think that if the PTO wanted to, it could put itself in the position to get Chevron deference on substantive questions. But it has not done so. It has declared very few opinions precedential, only three, and these are all on procedural questions. And it's never exercised, the director since the A has passed has never exercised um, the authority to do a rehearing. So with that, I will turn it over to Stuart, who will talk about why we think the Supreme Court may be and, and their lack of interest in administrative law may be lurking in the background in terms of the thinking of the administrative, uh, the executive branch. All right, so um, 1999, Supreme Court issues this opinion, Dickinson versus Zerko, in which it reversed the Federal Circuit. Uh, Supreme Court has been doing a lot of reversing the Federal Circuit over the last 10 years or so. Um, and it's, Federal Circuit had said, PTO is not subject to ordinary rules of administrative law, and Supreme Court says, you're wrong, administrative law applies to administrative agencies, and last we checked, the, administrative, the PTO is administrative agency, so principles of administrative law apply. Um, and um, article we wrote, Who's Afraid of the APA, eight years later, we highlighted Zerko, we highlighted this, and we're hoping there was going to be a trend going forward. Turned out there was a trend going forward, just not in patent law. Turned out, for instance, in tax law, um, the court said, hey, you IRS pr practitioners, you think you're special. You think that IRS is totally exempt from all the rules of ordinary administrative law. It's not. IRS is just another agency. Treasury is, uh, is just another um, agency. Um, so Chevron applies squarely to, to tax regulation. But in the, in the um, PTO context, in fact, um, the court hasn't seized opportunities that it hasn't, and, and instead has gone in um, a different direction. Now, there's only a few cases here, but it is kind of, um, it is kind of striking. So Microsoft versus I for I. Um, the question was about um, PTO grants and proving invalidity. And the court said there's a 1952 patent statute that applies here. But the statute, um, in, um, in fact, just codified a statement that the court made in a 1934 case. So it turns out, oh, the 1934 case is actually the one we look to, even though it was before the statute, because we interpret the statute as having codified what we in our wisdom said in, 19, um, in 1934. Now, in that case, the Solicitor General actually took that position, so you can say, okay, well, the government actually, okay, fine. Um, but um, then you have a case like um, Capos versus um, Hyatt, where the Solicitor General said, no, you should actually go, in effect, with um, standard principles of administrative exhaustion here, standard principles of administrative law um, apply. Um, and so, as a result, um, 
uh, agency expertise it precludes uh, um, introducing patent applicants, district court challenge in this context, exhaustion. And the court says, specifically rejected the claim, quoting here, that background principles of administrative law govern the admissibility of new evidence. Whoa, where did they get that from? An 1884 Supreme Court case, they say, that case actually is controlling here. By the way, the language in the 1884 case, I think if we read it, we would all actually uh, regard as dictum. Um, I mean, it was dictum, they, they, say, they, they said it squarely, but it also actually wasn't even part of the holding of the case. So here's something that's not even part of the holding of the case, and it turns out that, that um, the court is going to um, follow not ordinary principle of administrative law, which it says don't apply here because we have this earlier case and we think, in effect, the system has, that, that's been baked into the, in, into the system um, uh, all the way. And then finally, in 2015, um, Kimball versus Marvel Entertainment, um, the court has a question. There's an earlier case. It's quite clear the majority thinks the earlier case is suspect. The dissent thinks the earlier case should flat out be, um, be rejected. But even the majority is, is acknowledging the case is suspect. Um, but court says, look, there's that earlier case. There's no reason to think there's any ev evolution in, um, in patent law. Um, we're going to stick to that earlier case. So fairly, not a lot of data here, but three cases in which the court could have used, which you might think of as the kinds of reasoning that uses in other contexts, very heavily statutory, in which instead it says, oh, we have these earlier opinions that we're going to rely on, and we're going to stick with them. Um, does that um, tell us a huge amount? Um, not necessarily, but now this sort of plays into this question. Why isn't the PTO doing more to try to get substantive Chevron deference? So this, my little discussion of these cases, I think, is, um, is relevant to that. But let me first just highlight, um, we think it's gettable. And we don't even think it's that costly. So what would it require? So one thing the PTO director would have to do is set up a Chevron-ready um, regime. Um, there are political costs to that. There's no question you have to expend political capital in order to do that. You might annoy some PTAB judges um, in, in setting it up. But you know, those are, those are costs you can deal with as the, as the head of the PTO. And already talked about that, um, about that regime. Um, and the cost of implementation should be fairly low. Why do I say the cost of implementation for, should be fairly low? <coughs> I presume, I hope, as a taxpayer, the PTO director is already reviewing PTAB decisions to consider to, to, to review which ones the PTAB director finds problematic, which, which ones the PTAB director wants to make precedential. You're already engaging in a certain level of review. So actually formalizing that review and having in, you know, the PTO more formally review them isn't that much more than what I, I certainly hope you're already doing if you're a competent PTO, PTO director. Um, so I think the costs of setting up the system are not that great. So then why aren't they doing it? Um, well, then the question becomes, what is the benefit of getting yourself Chevron eligible? Um, and that's, again, where these prior cases are relevant. But let me just give you one more, um, a, a few more uh, relevant bits here. Um, and for those of you taking administrative law, we'll see what we're talking about next week in our class. This is prefiguring <laughs> what we'll be talking about very, 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 very shortly about, um, in some ways, the, the failed promise of, of, of Chevron. Um, Supreme Court has... Now, there have now been empirical studies showing, um, in particular by um, uh, Bill Eskridge and Lauren Baer, that in lots of cases where you would think Chevron should apply, the court, in fact, does not apply Chevron. You would, they, here's a, they've gone through, look, we, we read the opinion, seems like this is clearly a legal determination made by an agency, so, and it's done th through notice and comment or formal adjudication, and yet Chevron deference isn't, isn't applying. Um, so it seems to be less consistent than you would like as to whether Chevron applies. Um, that's the first strand. Second strand, um, there have been some notable cases in which the court has said at, where it has, uh, Eskridge and Bear are focusing on situations, they don't even mention Chevron. Like it seems like Chevron should apply, they don't even mention it. Then there are cases where it's clearly briefed and argued and the court has said at what we call Chevron step zero, oh, it turns out Chevron doesn't apply here at all, 
we're outside the Chevron regime. And let me note in that regard King versus Burwell, uh, the ACA case that was recently decided. There's a Chevron question there. Um, most people thought the court was going to apply Chevron deference, and then, and they didn't. So they found the statute ambiguous, and yet didn't defer. Why didn't they defer? Because they said, step zero, this is one of those cases where Chevron doesn't apply in the first place. Again, to prefigure what we talk about next week, um, Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes. Um, they don't leave really big decisions to agencies. Why am I highlighting this? That was written by Chief Justice Roberts, and that exactly mirrors what he said in City of Arlington. But in City of Arlington, he was in dissent. He lost that argument a mere three years ago, and then he now wins it in, in, uh, in the ACA case, in, in King versus Burwell. Um, so it may be that Chevron isn't applying as often as, um, as it should. Again, as you bear finding often isn't mentioned, and even cases where it is brief, sometimes they're finding in step zero. And then in addition to that, um, Eskridge and Bear also found that when they do apply Chevron, it doesn't seem as deferential as you might imagine from a reading of the Chevron case itself. Um, again, something we'll talk about soon enough, they, they find a fair amount of the time that, in fact, the statute is pretty clear at step one, and they never need to get to step two. You never get to that great deference um, at step two. So, it may be that Chevron is offering less than meets the eye, which therefore might make it less valuable to the, to the PTO. And so one thing I, I will throw in, I will let me acknowledge here, this is not strong empirical evidence. Um, it may also be that, um, that people who would be thinking about this in the, in the PTO also have a sense, which I'm sorry to say may be a correct sense, that these cases might not be the highest priority for the court. So one of the dirty little secrets on the Supreme Court is that there are some cases that are known as dog cases. There are other more barnyard epithets that are used as well to, to describe these cases. These are the, these are the <laughs> low priority cases that people think about, okay, great, the justice, I got stuck writing that opinion. So, hey, so I hate to say this, but patent cases are often treated as dog cases um, because they just aren't as sexy as some, um, as some, other, as some other kinds of cases. Um, the evidence of this is very, very thin, but I will just tell you that we looked up, there have been 28 patent cases decided in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and for what it's worth, I'll just tell you that they have disproportionately gone to justices who Richard Lazarus's numbers suggest get a disproportionate percentage of the dog cases. That is, they, he defines dogs as unanimous, um, short, quick opinions. So they seem to generate no interest in the court. It was unanimous. It was short, and it was decided quickly after, after argument. Um, he identifies the justices who are most likely to get those dog cases, and I will just tell you, they disproportionately write the patent cases. Um, and in fact, the justice who's, who, who both gets the fewest big cases and the most dog cases, Justice Thomas, has written six of those 28 cases that have been decided in patent. Is that enough data to go on? No, of course not. Why do we even mention it? Because. I could imagine, if I were advising the head of the PTO, saying both of the following two things. Um, I think you can get Chevron deference, and I think it will make some difference. But I think it may make less difference than you might have imagined just reading Chevron itself, um, especially because it looks like, back to those patent cases, it looks like in this context, um, the, the, the patent context, the court is more willing to rely on its own prior words even 130 years ago in dictum, um, than, uh, than ordinary principles of, of administrative law. And so at the end of the day, it may not be worth incurring all these various costs to try to get Chevron if it just isn't going to, uh, to move the needle. And so ironically, we noted at the end of our article, we may be in a situation where um, the agent, where the court decides and the agency defers. So we've got, we've got it exactly backwards. And I'll, let, let me stop there, and I, and I guess I'll, I guess Michael will now will we'll now take it over. Uh, so I think we're going to have John present uh, what is, in some ways, a counterpoint to uh, uh, Artie and Stewart's paper. <clears throat> All right. Uh oh, wait. We need to take these down. Or is, is, this a, is the screen coming down? I'm going to use the PowerPoint, yeah. Uh -oh. so. so we need to get the screen down. Oh, the screen. Ah. 
See, I do this myself in the classroom. And I have to walk to school uphill both directions, too. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sit over here a second. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's okay. All right, well, so um, thank you for having me here today. I, I, as, uh, as with Artie and um, Stuart and Melissa, I think it's wonderful to be having this conference here, uh, having the Duke Law Journal hosted. I noted uh, a couple of years ago when you had uh, a symposium like this devoted to tax law, and I thought, well, it's, it's got to only be a matter of time before we get to PAVLAW or IP. <laughs> and we did get around to that. Um, uh, so, in any event, um, I, I, I find it a little funny that I was invited to, to do this because, you know, Melissa was putting this together and she knew I had drafted this paper, which was so critical of her argument, uh, and I think it's a, a sign of the uh, generosity on her part to have me, have me present it here. <laughs> Maybe it's just so I can be ambushed uh, during this talk or something, but, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah, it's a little ironic, too, I guess, that, you know, Melissa, of course, is joining me last year, so maybe that's some generosity on my part that the University of Texas hired her, even though we argued over this in an office interview when she came to, to visit. Um, all right, so uh, my, my paper is, as, as uh, Artie Stewart pointed out, in part uh, arguing that I, I'm somewhat skeptical that the PTO, even if it takes the steps uh, that they recommend could get Chevron deference, although I agree they uh, would certainly make the case stronger. Um, on the other hand, I also argue that, uh, somewhat consistent with where Stewart ended, that getting Chevron isn't the be-all and the end-all. It's, it's maybe not so important uh, in terms of what the PTO can and uh, should seek to do uh, going forward. Okay, first I'll just spend a little time talking about the PTO's growth as an administrative agency, a growth that has turned it into really one of our larger administrative agencies uh, in the United States. Not nearly as large as the Social Security Administration, which has several tens of thousands of employees, uh, but really larger now uh, than many other agencies that are often seen as more prominent, like the SEC, which you know, has probably less than half as many employees as the USPTO, an annual budget less than half uh, of that of, uh, of the USPTO. So I'll talk just a little bit about that, about the PTAB and the post-issuance proceedings, uh, which have been talked about uh, a little before, but maybe give a, a bit more of the history here. Um, and then talk about the continuing limitations, which go, uh, uh, Artie has mentioned some of these. Uh, including the uh, use of the broadest uh, reasonable interpretation in these PTAB proceedings. Uh, and then I'll focus a bit on my arguments related to the PTAB proceedings and me. Finally, I'll end with my, what might be viewed as more, the more positive point, which is that I think despite these limitations, even if the USPTO can't get Chevron deference for its uh, understandings of substantive portions of the U.S. Patent Act, uh, it really is in position to have a great influence on how the law develops going forward. Uh, so in terms of growth, some of you may have seen these charts where we've just seen huge growth in patenting really since the beginning of the patent system, uh, but at least in terms of absolute numbers dramatically over the last uh, 30 years or so, where you've seen uh, patenting at rates of less than 100,000 patents per year now uh, reaching levels of about 300,000 uh, patents being issued each year. Uh, the size of the number of the examiner core in the U.S. Patent Office has been growing even more dramatically. Uh, and we now have an examiner core. This doesn't go quite up to the present, but we have an examiner core uh, that's getting toward about 10,000 uh, examiners. Um, we've had growth in the number of USPTO offices as we move now toward having four regional offices in addition uh, to the central office uh, in Alexandria, Virginia. There seems a bias toward having uh, offices in cities that begin with D. I don't know what the reason is for that. Austin was trying to get, I think Houston, Austin and Houston were both trying to get what was expected to be the Texas office, but, uh, but Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth uh, won out in that contest. 
Um, the budget of the USPTO, as I mentioned, quite large compared to a lot of administrative agencies, continues uh, to get larger. Now uh, the total program, annual program cost is in the nature of about $3 billion, most of that uh, being patent, and that's represented a substantial growth, more than six times uh, the, uh, the sort of annual budget uh, back about 20 years ago. Okay. Well, in terms of types of administrative proceedings, the USPTO has also uh, seen substantial growth. Um, before the 1980s, you had traditional administrative proceedings that could come after patent issues of reissue and correction, which could be initiated by the patent owner uh, in order, say, to get somewhat uh, different patent claims, often narrower claims, actually, to help preserve the uh, validity of the patent. Uh, but if brought within a certain period of time, could even be broader patent claims than in, in, in the original patent. And you could get correction for, say, technical errors or including uh, inventor an inventor who shouldn't have been included on the patent or uh, not including an inventor who should have been included and listed on the patent. Um, well, since then, we've had a number of post-issuance proceedings which really put the USPTO uh, in a much greater position to strike down and cancel um, issued patents. Uh, perhaps sua sponte, as can happen with ex parte reexamination, um, which can be initiated by the USPTO either uh, on its own motion or as a result of a request from any outside party. Perhaps the most famous ex parte reexamination resulted from the uh, much criticized uh, swinging on a swing patent. I don't know if you've, you've ever heard this. It's a patent for swinging on a swing where the invention, which is developed, I think, by a four-year-old, a very uh, uh, a child prodigy, uh, figured out that you could swing a swing side to side rather than merely back and forth by pulling the ropes on either side. Uh, and uh, his father, who was a patent attorney, thought it would be a great birthday gift to draft a patent application for him. I'm saying as a lark, then the USPTO went about and actually issued the patent on this. Uh, <laughs> The USPTO, it was massive, you know, well, massive by patent terms, but all this stuff. But there was sort of public outcry about how silly this patent was. So the USPTO launched an ex parte reexamination. They actually didn't conclude that. The father uh, apparently didn't want to pay the maintenance fee, the first maintenance fee on this patent, so it actually fell off on that ground. Uh, it was a little too much of a gift. The son was older. Actually, the, the best part of this patent, I thought, was not actually the, the claim, but was uh, so a part of the written description suggested you could enhance the technique of, of swinging from side to side by giving out a Tarzan-like yell. So this was, uh, <laughs> those in the patent community would appreciate, it was disclosing your best mode of the invention. Um, uh, in any event, uh, so ex parte reexamination was this first uh, this first post issuance proceeding, which was challenged constitutionally. We've seen as these sorts of proceedings have been rolled out over time, continual efforts to challenge them constitutionally. With some saying you can't have an administrative agency you know strike down a property right; it has to go through the courts. Those challenges have generally been. Uh, quashed by the uh, Federal Circuit, uh, but uh, ha haven't, we haven't had a Supreme Court decision yet on that. I, I don't think it should succeed, but we'll see if the Supreme Court decides to get into that game at some point. All right, so ex parte reexamination was the first of these. In 1999, we saw a Congress uh, intervene again, now to allow for a kind of adversarial proceeding to occur uh, post issuance at the USPTO. This is, might be viewed as even more innovative because we're having something distinct from the kind of examination you had at the USPTO before issuance. Now you're going to allow a challenger actually to continue to argue and brief a case as to why a particular patent claim or set of patent claims uh, shouldn't be considered valid. Um, the inter-parties reexamination took a little while to take off. Part of that was because it only applied to a sort of prospectively to uh, patents that were issuing later, uh, partly because people in the uh, patent community were a little wary of investing in these proceedings before the USPTO, particularly given the kind of estoppel uh, that would apply if you got into this proceeding. They weren't trusting uh, the PTO to necessarily run a very fair adversarial proceeding, the sense being that the PTO is in the business of issuing patents. 
They tend to declare that uh, patent applicants and patent owners are their customers, and so we would rather uh, argue our challenges to uh, patents uh, uh, before uh, the district courts or, or perhaps in the ITC. Okay, so this was slow to take off, but it really was gaining momentum uh, in uh, the first decade of this century, and uh, then Congress uh, really kind of put jet fuel behind this momentum uh, with the America Invents Act in 2011. There, Congress replaced inter-parties re-examination with this inter-parties review proceeding, which as already mentioned, is even much more trial-like, closer to the sort of uh, proceeding and process you might get uh, in a district court, as well as post-grant review covered business method review, which uh, with, within particular bounds. Post-grant review needs to be launched within a certain several month window after a patent issues. Cover business method review, as its title suggests, is only going to apply to business method patents. These proceedings allow you to challenge patent claims on essentially any validity grounds. Some people are arguing over whether it applies to subject matter eligibility, uh, but I think most people accept that it allows you to ch challenge patent claims on any validity grounds which is a much broader potential scope than you have an inter partes review or reexamination, re which are restricted to novelty and non-obviousness questions based on certain types of prior art. Um, so this has been really a vast expansion in the ability of the USPTO to act uh, on patents after they've issued. Uh, and as, as Artie has suggested, a lot puts the USPTO in a position to act as a substitute for at least certain parts uh, of litigation perhaps help correct some of the concerns uh, that our district courts are being overwhelmed with a lot of uh, poor quality patent suits. Okay. Um, well, in terms of just beyond the uh, proceedings, we've seen growth in the PTAB itself, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board that's conducting these proceedings. It replaced uh, a prior board at, at the USPTO called the Board of Patent of Appeals and Interferences. We've seen a, more, a great, more than a tripling of the size of the PTAB really during uh, the era of the uh, AIA. And we've seen massive growth in the workload of the PTAB. And inter partes review, we've gone from 17 uh, petitions for inter partes review in 2012, uh, up by a factor of 100 to 1,737 uh, in fiscal year 2015. Uh, so the chief judge who's had to deal with this has really had to do a tremendous job dealing with an incredible ramping up of this kind of, uh, kind of work before the USPTO. And cover business method review, uh, we're not seeing quite as many as you would expect. You wouldn't see quite as many because of the uh, uh, limited uh, subject matter there, but actually seeing uh, you know, massive growth in terms of the numbers of cover business method, method review proceedings, or at least requests for that as well, up to 149 last year. Post-grant review is just starting to take off uh, because we're now seeing patents issued under the new novelty uh, provisions of the AIA. Okay. Um, so we've had a sort of massive where you can see the instituted trials are in the nature of, uh, on, on the nature of uh, about a, a, a thousand now um, coming out of these, uh, these petitions. Um, and the PTAB opinions have had a, uh, at least a, a notable impact in the individual cases where they've been heard. Uh, they certainly caught the eye of the patent committee, uh, the patent community. Uh, with the first 80 or so decisions, Greg Dolan was quite critical <laughs> of this development, uh, followed the first 80 IPR decisions, said that in those first 80 IPR decisions, you saw all contested claims being struck down in almost two-thirds of the cases, uh, and then overall more than 70 percent of the contested claims being canceled. Um, these rates have, have, have lowered since then. Um, I should note also this these sorts of results led to the then Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit uh, characterizing PTAB panels as patent death squads, um, which I don't think was meant as a, as a compliment. Um, uh, we have seen a lowering of these rates, but still you know, very substantial numbers of claims, very substantial percentage of claims being canceled uh, in these inter partes review proceedings. Um, if you look at the... Um, IPRs uh, terminated by April 30th of 2015. 
Uh, you see that um, they're instituting IPRs on a, a little under half of the claims being challenged. Um, Oh, sorry, over half of the claims being challenged, which are, represent a, a little under half of the claims that were available to challenge in the patents at issue. Uh, and then you're seeing over a third of those claims on which IPR has been instituted being struck down. And if you look back at the number of claims originally challenged, it's about one quarter of them. Now, there's been an interesting development in the next eight months of 2015. What you see is the uh, USPTO is instituting uh, challenges less, going from 65% to 31%, but when it is instituting the challenge, it's much more likely to strike, strike down the claims, so 62% versus 38%, with the overall result coming out fairly similar. It's a little down, but 19% uh, of the claims originally challenged in requests for IPR uh, struck down as opposed to 25% before. So this may suggest, this is rough figures, we have, but this may suggest the USPTO or PTAB is actually um, dealing with the increased workflow on this front relatively well. It's getting better at identifying uh, or going forward specifically with those challenges where it's more likely to strike down the relevant claims. Um, and so maybe there's some hope they'll be able to deal with this uh, continued increase uh, and request for inter partes review in the future. Okay, all right. So we have a lot going on at the PTAB. A, a, a big uh, problem just in terms of administration that the USPTO is going to have to deal with, which might lead to later work by uh, Melissa and Michael studying the PTAB and how it's dealing with specific cases as an extension of their, their, their past work studying uh, uh, what, what PTO examiners are doing in original examination. Okay, well, nonetheless, we have limitations on what the USPTO can do. And uh, one of the main limitations is we're just dealing with questions of patent validity or patentability, whether patent claims uh, should be issued and should be uh, enforced. We're not dealing with questions of infringement. Uh, uh, so this is somewhat of a lead in to a forthcoming work I have, a work in progress where uh, some co-authors and I are actually gonna argue uh, that we should have, uh, or at least we should consider having, a kind of administrative front end to patent litigation, where before you can go forward with patent litigation, you're actually going to have an administrative review panel look at the case both uh, on questions of validity and on questions of infringement. Um, okay, my sense is, unless you want to get into a big argument over constitutionality, this is not going to, this is necessarily, this is generally going to have to be a kind of advisory opinion rather than a binding opinion concerns about jury rights and uh, the province of Article III courts, uh, but it can uh, allow for an administrative agency uh, to get in the game on both ends, both infringement uh, and validity, which can be important because there's often a concern when you're only arguing infringement or validity in a particular forum, you can, uh, in a phrase that I, I'm not sure what the origin was in patent law. The patent owner can then has the opportunity to treat the patent claim as a nose of wax, twisting it back and forth, presenting it as a bit more narrower when they're trying to defend its validity, uh, then some, somehow finding that you can give it a broader construction when they're uh, involved in an infringement case. In the current work in progress, we are arguing that the preferred forum for this would actually be a separate review board, separate from the USPTO, but certainly uh, having this within the USPTO would be uh, one, one option. Okay, so we're not addressing infringement questions. That's one major uh, limitation. Uh, another major limitation uh, is that the USPTO is applying this broadest reasonable claim construction standard rather than reading claims as courts would, which you might characterize as looking for the most reasonable claim construction, sort of the best. Uh, claim construction, uh, and this creates, you know, sort of two problems, that the courts in the USPTO can be a bit out of sync when they're looking at the same uh, patent. Uh, it also limits the uh, extent to which uh, USPTO claim construction can have influence uh, on the courts later. The courts can dismiss it more easily when they say, well, the USPTO is applying a, a different approach to claim construction uh, than we do. Um, that might be changed by the Supreme Court. It might also be changed through legislative action. There's been some push uh, 
uh, in Congress uh, to, to redress this, although it hasn't, I think, been a, a huge push yet. Um, the next uh, limitation is one we'll talk about more, actually, the next two. One, there's the lack of general substantive rulemaking authority uh, in the USPTO. And then beyond that, although related to that, uh, the sense under current law that the USPTO doesn't have an entitlement to Chevron deference for its interpretation of substantive aspects of the U.S. Patent Act, say, what the test for non-obviousness should mean uh, in, 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 in practice. Okay. Well, as Artie and Stewart have indicated uh, in, in their article and in uh, Melissa's earlier article, some argument has been made that the PTAB proceedings um, do provide a basis for Chevron deference. Uh, and as they've indicated, I'll just give a little background here, uh, Chevron is generally desirable for administrative agencies because it allows for a very high level of deference or requires a very high level of deference for the courts, from the courts. When it applies, essentially the courts are to treat uh, the agency's interpretation of the statute as binding as long as it's reasonable. Uh, that's sort of simplification because there's a Chevron two-step, but um, uh, at the end of the day, I, I think that's largely what it comes down to. Um, further, the agency can change its interpretation and still get Chevron deference. That was actually the case uh, in Chevron itself. And then, perhaps most strikingly, uh, the agency can trump a prior uh, interpretation by the courts. Uh, and still have its interpretation uh, be viewed as pre pre presumptively binding. Uh, that was ruled on by the Supreme Court uh, this past decade in, in a case called Brand X. Um, so this is a very powerful uh, deference regime uh, for the agencies. If they don't get Chevron deference, the general regime that's seen as applying is this regime of Skidmore deference. Um, which is a sliding scale regime in which courts consider the totality of circumstances to decide how much weight they should give to the agency's statutory interpretation you know, based on what, what relevant expertise the agency had, how carefully it uh, deliberated on the issue, uh, how persuasive its arguments are. Uh, because of this emphasis on the sort of power to persuade, some have suggested Skidmore is really not a deference regime at all. Uh, it's more just saying the agency view is a kind of evidence as to a proper statutory interpretation, just like any uh, evidence or, or opinion or argument that might be put before the court. Okay, well, as, as was indicated again by Artie and Stewart, we have a case called Mead, which gives us instruction on when uh, Chevron applies. Not necessarily the clearest instruction, but gives us some instruction. And there are two basic questions, kind of an additional two-step that come out of need. A first question of, did Congress grant interpretive authority to the relevant agency, uh, a Chevron-level interpretive authority to that agency? And then did the agency exercise that authority? And you know, my major concern with the PTAB is that I, I think the case for saying that Congress granted the interpretive authority uh, to the USPTO is problematic here. Okay, and now why, why do I think it's problematic? First is this elephant in a mouse hole concern that Stewart has already uh, adverted to in relation in another context. Um, that the background understanding has been the USPTO does not have the Chevron level authority. Um, the fact that the USPTO uh, is not understood to have it with regard to substantive questions had been highlighted in the decade leading up to the AIA. We had a huge controversy over some rules on continuation applications. Actually, I'm not going to explain what continuation applications are, but uh, rules on continuation applications in which the USPTO was trying to restrict continuation practice. There was a big debate over are these substantive or procedural? And that was seen as crucial in the Federal Circuit for whether uh, Chevron deference was going to apply. Then in one of the prior bills that was in the family tree ultimately leading to the AIA, and a House bill that was, in, uh, that was voted on by the House and passed by the House but didn't become law, uh, there had been a provision to give the USPTO general rulemaking authority and a, uh, a, an insertion in the House committee report, I think, suggesting that this was going to come with a general grant of, uh, or expectation of deference from the courts. 
the patent community, at least certain sectors of the patent community, exploded in response to that, and it was dropped from later bills. The USPTO then, speaking of being non-aggressive, going to where it already began, the USPTO was even denying that it wanted Chevron deference on substantive questions. It's very strange uh, and somewhat disingenuous because I, I know during this time the USPTO was denying any desire for that. I was on a panel with David Kapos, who is the head of the USPTO. I said, well, I have this paper arguing you should get Chevron deference at, through a legal change. You, get, you should get Chevron deference uh, on questions of subject matter eligibility. And he said, this was not in the public part of this, but sort of aside after the panel, he said, well, I'll take whatever I can get. So, I, so I think this is a political move by the USPTO to claim they didn't want, even want Chevron uh, authority, uh, but in fact, uh, as you would think an agency uh, would, they, they would be happy to take whatever they could get. They just didn't think in the political marketplace they could get that. Uh, so again, in this, with this backdrop, this seems to me something of an elephant if the USPTO is through these uh, adjudicative proceedings going to get the Chevron level authority. Another point, a relatively weak point, but something worth pointing out, uh, is if you give the USPTO Chevron level authority, effectively you're weakening the federal circuit. And you're, to some degree, replacing the federal circuit as the primary practical expositor of what the US Patent Act means. Um, Congress has, despite all the criticism of the federal circuit, Congress hasn't seemed so interested in cutting back the power and authority of the federal circuit. They've tended to increase its jurisdiction over time, and they did that uh, in the AIA, where they uh, sort of overturned, effectively, a Supreme Court decision saying the federal circuit doesn't have jurisdiction over compulsory counterclaims uh, uh, arising from the Patent Act, um, and now they do thanks to the American Vets Act. Okay. Finally, um, one point that, uh, based on the statutory language that uh, uh, Melissa I, I makes in her paper, uh, and that might suggest that this wasn't a mouse hole, is that the AIA, with regard to these post-issuance proceedings, provides for the USPTO to institute them if it sees a kind of issue of law that's of general importance. Um, so it's allowing the USPTO to institute these proceedings not simply based on suspicion about the patentability of the patent claims at issue in that particular case. Uh, and the suggestion is that this means the Congress is contemplating that the USPTO is going to uh, get in early now, and they want to give the USPTO an opportunity to get in early to give a definitive uh, determination of some kind of legal question, a substantive legal question with regard to the Patent Act. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting argument. I think, to me, it's the statutory language still isn't clear enough to convert this, uh, uh, to, to move this out of the elephant and mouse hole box, uh, from my sense of things. Further, when Senator Kyle in the uh, legislative history, maybe the only part of the legislative history uh, directly on point, when he talks about that provision, he describes it as having the purpose of allowing uh, for early determinations of these issues with the PTAB certifying the question to the Federal Circuit. And that certification language to me suggests that the Federal Circuit is still being viewed, uh, the Article III courts are still being viewed as the more definitive expositors on the question of law. Because when you talk of certification, you're generally saying we're going to give it to the primary authority in the area. Okay. Um, so that's you know, the basic argument there. The, the last point, which already is essentially already covered for me, has to do with the structure of the structure of uh, this adjudicative process. Certainly more formal than what the USPTO has done before. Um, might be viewed as as formal as what the Board of Immigration Appeals does. And the, and the Supreme Court has said the Board of Immigration Appeals, despite being a very bizarre body, does get Chevron deference. Um, but you know, still doesn't really fit um, the model for conventional formal adjudication. And as already pointed out, you know, perhaps my strongest objection here is that we don't have, in my view, generally speaking, a decision by the agency in this process. And if anything, the way the statute is written, the Federal Circuit is put in the position of 
quote, the agency as it would normally be contemplated in, in formal adjudication, because the appeal goes from the PTAB to the Federal Circuit rather than the PTAB to the agency, which under the APA, the American Administrative uh, Procedure Act, would be, say, the commissioners of the SEC or the commissioners of the ITC. Um, Presidential PTAB rulings, I think, do uh, provide the best case uh, for Chevron deference because they do help address this agency problem. Part of the problem, however, is still you're not having a true hearing, even under the USPTO's procedure, where the parties get to argue it over, uh, argue over the result, uh, as you would uh, say in a proceeding before the International Trade Commission. Um, a second point, now, on this point of the director's ability essentially to stack a USPTO panel on rehearing, it's true the Federal Circuit has said that under the statute that's allowed, uh, but a question that was reserved was whether that would violate due process, okay? And um, that hadn't been challenged by the parties. And, and to me, uh, if the director is stacking panels uh, in a particular case, uh, in order to have their deputies on the panel to control the result, uh, that does raise uh, substantial due process concerns and undercuts a bit that the idea that we have more formal proceedings before the USPTO uh, um, is a basis now for Chevron level deference. Okay. So I'm quite skeptical of that, although I do agree there's more the USPTO could do to try to make its uh, case stronger. Um, however, uh, at the end of the day, the bright light here is that I don't think Chevron deference is really that important. Uh, and in fact, the idea that the agency has to work harder uh, under a Skidmore deference regime in order to get its way might not be viewed always as a terribly bad thing. Uh, the more formal proceedings the USPTO has, the opportunities for fact-finding it provides should put it in a better position to persuade the courts that what it's done has been done through reasoned deliberation and should be given deference. If you think of the Myriad case, which might be another example of the USPTO viewing the patent regime as a little different, in the Myriad case, the Supreme Court basically said, oh, well, we understand the PTO has issued these patents on genetic sequences for decades. It still seems to have that as its position, but they don't seem to have thought it through so well. There doesn't seem to be anything really to defer to here, plus the DOJ has apparently come out on the opposite side of the issue. If the uh, USPTO had rulings on this issue through PTAB proceedings with the kind of reasoned opinions you get there, they might have been in a better position, whether you like that position or not, in order to get deference in uh, a case like Myriad. So I think these proceedings, by putting the USPTO in a greater uh, position to persuade, by putting it in a position to be a first mover on legal issues even more often and more broadly than it has been in the past, uh, and uh, by putting it in a position to interpret its own regulations in ways that it can get deference uh, can allow it really to have a much more substantial influence on how the law develops. Uh, and in respect to, with respect to interpretation of regulations, we've already seen how slippery the difference between substance and procedure can be, at least from the Federal Circuit's perspective, uh, the USPTO uh, gets Chevron deference on the assignment of burdens, burdens of proof when someone looks to amend claims uh, in a PTAB proceeding. This is interesting because there's Supreme Court precedent, including the Medtronic case, which involved patent law, where the Supreme Court has indicated that burdens of proof are substantive uh, more than they're procedural. So we'll have to see how this works out. Uh, but it shows how you can have really substantial substantive effects even with the authority the USPTO has. All right, thank you. Great, so why don't uh, we call up Chris and Sapna to offer some commentary on the two papers. I think we'll sit down so that Sapna can elbow me when I'm <laughs> out of time, and so she get her time in too. So this is a, this is a lot of fun, and, and it, it, it's it, it's so great to be here. Uh, so administrative exceptionalism. I, I I'll put my cards on the table. I don't know anything about patent law. I did three or four patent trials in private practice, and that's about as far as it goes. Uh, 
Uh, but I know a little bit about administrative law exceptionalism. So this is the idea that certain regulatory fields are so special, so exceptional, that standard administrative law principles don't apply. So for instance, the tax court might say, you know what, we don't have to apply the Administrative Procedure Act judicial review provisions because uh, we are special. Uh, something about tax makes it exempt. Uh, an agency might argue that they don't have to follow, like the IRS has done, the rulemaking provisions because the Administrative Procedure Act does not apply. Or you might have an additional argument that's happened in the tax context and others that Chevron deference shouldn't apply. And that's what these two papers are really about. But it's, it's a really hot topic. I'm sure for those of you that are three L's or one L's, you were in this room two years ago, probably not, <laughs> about tax <laughs> exceptionalism. Uh, and, and tax exceptionalism is an area where really, really quite a, a hot area where the court has, has done a 180 uh, on whether uh, administrative law principles should be the defaults. Uh, just this last month at the American Association of Law Schools annual meeting, there was an administrative law section panel on is, is immigration law administrative law? And we have a symposium going on at the Yale Journal of Regulation this week on that. Uh, and then, of course, this morning, to preempt this all or incur on the bullet conspiracy, up the ante, uh, not just arguing that it, that it doesn't apply, administrative law doesn't apply uh, to... Uh, patent law, but also that doesn't apply to criminal law. And I think on criminal law, it's actually quite well settled that criminal law is a little bit different. On patent law, a little bit harder. Although there's some fun cases coming up. There's a dissent from Judge Sun of the Sixth Circuit just a couple weeks ago, for those that are really geeky into you know, criminal law, administrative law, about whether the rule of lenity trumps Chevron deference. And the in-bank majority there said that it doesn't. Judge Sutton's already said before that it does, and it, he lost this time and said that it doesn't. So there's a lot going on. If you want to add more, financial regulation, trade, antitrust, these are all areas where scholars in the fields and courts tend to follow them, uh, would say that uh, their regulatory field is special. Uh, and I'm here to say it's not special, uh, although I'm responding to papers that are very carefully framed within the administrative law frameworks. It's not quite as fun to say it's not special. Uh, but uh, but I, I'm going to say that. And I'll put my cards on the table. I'm not going to go into the substance as much in the interaction on Mead, although at the end of the day, I, I think, I don't think, I'm much more in the camp of Stewart and Artie, uh, that this looks a lot more like immigration adjudication, where that's not formal adjudication, and yet there's no dispute that Chevron deference applies. Uh, there are some critical differences that John hammers home in his paper that we could talk about more in, in the Q&A. Ultimately, I don't think those criminal, those differences are going to make a difference if the court is presented with the question of Chevron deference. Uh, but that is something that, 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 that I'd love to talk about more in the Q&A if the audience and the other panelists are interested. So but what I want to do with my remaining five minutes is say to student Artie, make a stronger case. Uh, and I say that in the sense that uh, you, know, we, you, you referenced tax exceptional at the beginning and how the Supreme Court did a 180. But the Supreme Court did a 180, I think in large part because of a law professor named Kristen Hickman. Uh, and if you follow what she did, she wrote a number of articles similar to why we should not, why tax law should not be afraid of the APA, uh, and continued to hammer home this theme. And then she followed up those law review articles with amicus briefs in the DC Circuit and ultimately in the Supreme Court, reinforcing the idea that administrative law should be the default. And it had a really powerful effect. Uh, and I think that's something that I, and I want to kind of push back on some of the ideas at the end of the paper uh, that Stuart had mentioned is that, you know, the PTO director might not really have the, want to waste the political capital here, or, uh, and, and I want to get back to that in a second, but before I get there, one, and, uh, the prime mover thing I, I love too, uh, the idea that, well, the, the uh, PTAV is still the first mover, they're going to decide all these cases, they're going to set, but the problem is if, they're already stuck with the Supreme Court precedents that are narrowing the substantive law. They're not the first mover, right? I mean, they're already kind of stuck with that. And then on top of that, some of my prior empirical work, I see Rochelle shaking her head, but, <laughs> uh, but some, of my, some of my prior empirical work, yeah. There are some open questions, that's right. But there are a lot of closed questions too, yeah. Uh, and some of my prior, prior, prior empirical work looking at rule drafters is that rule drafters, if they no Chevron applies, they're going to be more aggressive. Uh, at least there's some, some suggestion in the data. Whereas if they don't, uh, if they think that, the, that it's not going to be reviewed under a deferential standard, uh, 
they might not be as aggressive, or as aggressive might be one word, true to what they think the statute really means, or is the best interpretation of it. Uh, but, but to kind of move back to the make a stronger case point, um, I was scared when I read your Supreme, the, the, the analysis of the Supreme Court, recent Supreme Court decisions that talked about you know uh, the patent law and how they were just doing you know traditional statutory interpretation. Until I started looking at it more carefully, and no one's presented the Chevron Brand X question there, right? I mean, it's not like it's been they haven't been asked to provide any deference there. Uh, the Supreme Court has been acting against this backdrop of feeling like they're the primary interpreters. And if you look at the tax cases, it's the exact same thing, right? I mean, you do have national muffler that comes in and messes things up a bit. But like, but for the most part in tax, the court was kind of acting along that way. And I would say, you know, Brand X, and this is the idea that uh, a prior, a, a subsequent agency interpretation could trump uh, court's interpretation of an ambiguous statute the agency administers. That has a lot of power here. And I would point you to the case of Nagusi, decided probably four or five years ago. Weird case. It was an immigration case where the agency had interpreted the statute to say that the persecutor bar applied. Uh, but they interpreted it based on a 1953 or 4 uh, decision from the Supreme Court saying that the persecutor bar would apply. And the Supreme Court took a look at that and said, well, no, we, we, we were interpreting an ambiguous statute. And after Brand X, you have your own opportunity to interpret it. And not only that, but we're not going to decide this. We're going to actually send it back to the agency to interpret it anew without any Supreme Court gloss, prior gloss. And I think that's the type of move that you might be able to make uh, in this context. The other thing I would say is the Supreme Court seems to really hate the Federal Circuit right now. <laughs> you know, it, it's becoming like the Sixth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, a little bit of a four-letter word. We like to take cases from them. And I think my favorite line is John earlier said, if we give the PTAB more power, it's weakening the federal circuit. That should be point three in your amicus brief in Quozo, right? <laughs> like, if you want to weaken the federal circuit's power, because uh, you think they're getting the substance of patent law wrong, uh, give more power to the PTAB. Um, and, and, and then lastly, I, I, I want to say that the focus on the director of the PTO, for me, isn't the only focus. I would focus on DOJ and civil appellate. Because that's, you know, and I love Nick Perillo's really awesome piece on legislative history, and this is where he looked back in the, you know, th the, from like the 30s to the 60s and figure out why did the court start using legislative history? And his bottom line answer, it's because DOJ started citing legislative history. Uh, and I think you, that, that a lot of this needs to be addressed, not at the director, but at uh, DOJ, because DOJ is the one that's ultimately making decisions about whether to uh, seek deference or not. And I would say that the Quozo case is a really fun one, and I'm still trying to figure out what's going on there. In the brief in opposition, they make two interesting moves. One, they say that the American Vents Act gives them substantive rulemaking authority and not just procedural. Uh, and, and I think they have to, because when they get to, this, to the merit stage, and I'm not a patent law person, but broadest reasonable construction doctrine, that's not procedural, right? Uh, I mean, they have a secondary argument in the brief in opposition where they say it is, if it is, in any event, this is a procedural doctrine, but it can't be a procedural doctrine. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, in pages 15 and 16, yeah. Uh, and, and I know, I, I may know that I've been told to take a look out for the merits brief, because it's going to make an even better argument. <laughs> yes, the, the brief in opposition from the, from, the, from the director, yeah, from DOJ, uh, from Civil Appellate, yeah. Um, and so that, that's, that's pretty fascinating, uh, that they say, you know, there's nothing in that statutory grant. Again, that's dealing with rulemaking, but in the Q&A, if we want to talk about that more, if the idea is, does the agency have substantive power granted them from Congress, uh, and, and that's, a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, and then the second uh, you know, point there is that you do see, although in the brief in opposition, they don't throw Chevron out front, it's similar to the Federal Circuit's opinion, it's in the background, you know when they get to the briefs on the merits, they're going to throw it out front, you know, as argument two. They're going to have to, because I have a hard time seeing, as a non-patent expert, uh, the decision uh, uh, below surviving without some type of invocation of Chevron. So with that, I'll stop and turn over to Sapna. Thank you. Um, just a couple of background comments first before getting into John's paper. Um, 
First of all, we've been talking a lot today about exceptionalism um, with regard to patents and administrative law, but I think it is worth asking the question, how much does exceptionalism still exist in patents today? Um, with the change in composition in the federal circuit, we're beginning to see you know, a lot more, judges being a lot more mindful um, of administrative law. Um, for example, with the ITC getting Chevron deference um, in the en banc Suprema decision, like we're beginning to see more um, attention being paid to following proper administrative law principles. Though, granted, the heavy weight of past precedent still looms large and um, I think is what's contributing to a number of problems. Um, a second just background point, if the PTO doesn't want Chevron, at the end of the day, none of this is going to matter. We, we can all argue one way or the other, but it is going to come down to the agency itself actually wanting the deference. I mean, if it just stays quiet and never asks for it, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how much our, our dialogue is going to matter. Though at the same time, it's, it's worth mentioning, people used to say the same thing about the ITC 10 years ago. Oh, the ITC doesn't want Chevron deference. And they, they certainly came around and now they have the deference um, that I've been arguing for. So maybe they'll, maybe they'll get there if we just encourage them um, enough. <laughs> Uh, so the point, the main point I wanted to address with John's paper um, is the idea that the federal circuit is serving the position analogous to the agency. Um, so kind of the argument that he's making is that with this direct appeal to the federal circuit from the PTAB, the federal circuit is essentially overseeing things, reconciling disparate um, a, um, administrative judge opinions, and you know, playing the role of the top level. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this raises a major problem, which is the consumer watchdog versus wharf decision. So in consumer watchdog, the federal circuit held that consumer watchdog could not appeal an adverse PTAB decision to the federal circuit. And the reason that they gave was they lacked constitutional standing. They didn't have injury in fact because they were just a generalist group. They had no stake in the, the litigation other than just that of a concerned citizen. So this raises a question, well, first of all, let me just say um, I do actually, while I disagree as a policy matter on the consumer watchdog decision, I think as a matter of administrative law based on Supreme Court precedent that it was actually correctly decided. Um, this does create a problem, which is if we're expecting the federal, if we're saying that Congress's intent all along was to have the federal circuit kind of even things out, well, the Federal Circuit can't do that job because not all of the cases that the PTAB you know, decides are going to be appealable um, to the Federal Circuit. Now, you know, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. Um, you know, one is that Congress just had no idea that it was creating this problem, that it just never occurred to them that there wouldn't be this level of appeal, in which case John's argument you know, still has the same force in terms of what was their intent. Um, Though it's it's hard to say in terms of whether you know they would have foreseen this um, or not, but it's important to note that you know regardless we're going to need that to have that fixed. We're going to need to make sure we have some kind of uniform mechanism um, for appealing these decisions. Um, a second point that I wanted to talk about. So John in his paper you know mentions you know we'll always have Skidmore that. Even if we don't have Chevron, there's still Skidmore. Skidmore is, is not nothing. Skidmore is something, um, and that counts for something. Um, I still question, though, how much deference is Skidmore really going to be? Because uh, John cites to uh, Kristen Hickman's empirical study from 10 years ago that showed that you know, Skidmore actually does have some effect in um, you know, leading to, to courts affirming the agency. But I'm not sure we can assume that the, the semi-specialized federal circuit, to use John's own terminology, is going to treat Skidmore the same way compared to a generalist court of appeals. So I question how applicable Kristen's empirical research is to the area of patents. Um, now, if there's empirical data with the DC Circuit, maybe that would be more persuasive. I, off, I, I teach administrative law, but offhand, I can't remember 
what the DC Circuit's approach is to Skidmore. So it's possible that you know the DC Circuit, which is also semi-specialized, is willing to do that. But I, I think it's worth mentioning we're just not sure uh, at this point whether Skidmore would actually gain anything or whether the Federal Circuit would take a more heavy-handed approach, use its own expertise, and just never, uh, you know, never pay any attention to what the the PTAB has done. Um, Another thing I want to mention with regard to Mead. So Mead tells us that there's you know things that we tend to see with cases that get Chevron deference, but they're not rigid requirements, right? It's sort of like there are these things that we associate with with cases that are are receiving Chevron. So there's a few things that um, you know that John mentioned that I'm not sure just how salient um, they are. So. The number of judges uh, is one of them. The John talks about how there's more than 200 um, of these administrative judges uh, currently um, in the PTAB. Um, but it's worth asking how many of those judges are actually assigned to hearing IPRs and hearing post-grant review? What percentage is it? Because so talking to Melissa yesterday, just a random conversation, she was mentioning to me that it's actually a smaller subset of that. Like it's not all 200 of these judges that hear these cases, it's actually a smaller group. Now I don't know how much smaller, and Mead doesn't give us a line drawing guide in terms of is it 200, is it 100, is it 50, like when is it too many? But um, I, I think that's worth looking into. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning, uh, John, you talked about how the uh, PTO does not have substantive rulemaking authority, and, and obviously there's, there's debate on this. Um, it is worth mentioning that uh, after you know, Melissa and I both were trying to scour, like, is there an agency that gets Chevron deference that doesn't have substantive rulemaking authority? Turns out it's the International Trade Commission. Um, ITC has Chevron, you know, gets Chevron deference through use formal adjudication. But back in the 80s, they tried to engage in substantive rulemaking authority, and members, a few members of Congress actually called them out on it. And the, PT, uh, the ITC at that point just gave up. They never tried again. So on one hand, a court never formally, you know, never decided once and for all they don't have rulemaking authority, but they don't seem to think that they do anymore, as far as I can tell at least. Um, so I've already run over um, our time for the Q&A, so why don't I just conclude there, and I welcome um, questions. Um, so why don't we invite the paper authors back up, and why, why don't we bring another chair? Everyone can, yeah. I'm just, I can't resist saying while we're setting up that in King v. Burwell, Skidmore wasn't even talked about, right? <laughs> so if, if, we're, if we're in a Chevron step zero world, right, right, right. it's not entirely clear that Skidmore is the default anymore. Well, she, she wants to see the bio, but let's sit down. You can say that, I mean, the court declared that the uh, IRS has no relevant expertise. <laughs> sure, that. okay. Let's let's sure. Oh, I'm totally fine. But it is a legitimate point. I mean, Peter Strauss had uh, suggested that if you read some of the court's decisions, it's not clear that the justices are so committed to Skidmore either. Part of the reason I can tell you, a number of clerks, when I was clerking for the Supreme Court, would say, Skidmore is a deference anyway. I mean, it's power to persuade, it's not deference. So I'm going to do two very stereotypical law professor things. Uh, first, I'm going to invoke the moderator's privilege to ask the first question. Um, and then second, I'm going to ask it in at least two parts. <laughs> <laughs> at least. At least. <laughs> uh, so what I want to ask the panelists is, you know, the, much of the interplay between Artie and Stewart's paper and John's paper is over the descriptive question whether the PTO, when it renders through the PTAB these decisions in IPRs or other proceedings, you know, is entitled to deference as a matter of administrative law. I want to ask the normative question, which is, does the panel, or to what extent do panelists think the PTO ought to be given deference in these circumstances. Um, because I've made the argument, uh, and Jonathan Mazur, who's uh, here, has made the argument, uh, that in some ways we ought to enact changes in law that give the PTO real rulemaking authority, that make it into a much more New Deal-style agency uh, 
akin to the FCC or whatnot. Uh, and that gives it power over patent law. But that's not the agency that we have, and that's not the agency that we appear to be on a track towards having, at least in the foreseeable future. So from the perspective of patent law, one set of questions to ask is, you know, ought we uh, to defer to PTAB decisions? What would be the benefits or drawbacks uh, in doing so? And then the second part of the question would be to turn that around uh, and ask it again from the perspective of administrative law. Because in some ways, the case of patents you know, really raises quite starkly some of the problematics of need, right, that have been discussed in the ad law literature now, you know, probably since that decision was rendered. Because on the one hand, you've got, you know, John's elephants and mouse holes uh, problem, right? So the famous language from FDA versus Brown and Williamson, you know, that would appear to apply with great force here. Congress considered granting the PTO substantive rulemaking authority and rejected it in 2007. Uh, and notwithstanding the arguments in Cuozo, which I was just scanning, um, you know, that seems to be a pretty strong indication that there's no substantive rulemaking authority. On the other hand is Chris's point, which is if you look at the composition and the procedures associated with the PTAB decisions in IPRs and CBM proceedings, this is formal adjudication. Maybe they don't use the magic words, but Melissa's made a really compelling argument that nevertheless, you know, this is clearly the type of administrative procedure to which courts defer. And so maybe that tells us something about the framework of need, that we don't have a coherent sense yet of when, from the perspective of administrative law, the normative question, should agencies be the subject of deference, or should agencies be the, the decisions be the subject of deference, you know, when ought that to happen? Um, so I'll sort of turn it over to the panel for some thoughts on that. So I'll start um, with a few thoughts. So those are great questions. And the normative issue is not one we take on squarely in this paper, although we're going to add something on it, because I think it, it's too big not to take on, because it's just too important. And I do think, since, since I'm kind of making it up from scratch here, Stuart may or may or not agree with me, but I do think that certainly precedential opinions as a normative matter should be the sorts of things that get Chevron deference. Um, I think that is a descriptive matter as well, but I think this case is even stronger, frankly, as a normative matter. Because it seems to me that if you've got a situation where the, the case has been gone through all the vetting that a presidential opinion has to go through, how can that possibly not be the sort of thing where the agency has not engaged in the kind of deliberation that should produce the force of law? And then the question becomes, and I'm sure John is going to say this, well, is that what Congress intended? Did Congress intend, um, because the presidential opinion process is not what, um, is not something that Congress set up. That's just an internal PTO procedure. And that's not entirely incorrect. That said, you know, the Congress did give PTO, the PTO director, general policymaking supervision. And I can't imagine setting up an agency in which the director doesn't have authority over the agency. I mean, that just seems implausible as a matter of basic administrative law. Um, that, that, and, you know, we were, Stuart and I were even talking about the question of, you know, how, if PTAB judges couldn't be overruled, wouldn't that, I mean, they can be fired, I suppose, but um, it, it really does raise questions about whether they're truly inferior officers, it seems to me, within the meaning of the appointments clause. Just to jump, so we haven't talked about, so I will, and I'll actually go further. So I agree with all of that, and let me, but let me just add first, just on your, on your Mead point, um, it is interesting in this regard that Souter did not give us a bright line. And why didn't he give us a bright line? Well, he says because we're trying to follow Congress's um, um, intent here, and we think sometimes Congress would have wanted things that were less than full 556, 557 formal adjudication, nonetheless, to get deference. And I think that's actually, I think that's a normatively attractive way of th thinking about this in terms of Congress's intent. But now let me talk about the bigger, the bigger normative question. So let me put my own, my, my own normative cards on the table. Part of the reason why we wrote the article about who's afraid of the APA. Um, in general, I am wary about people saying, oh, my area is special because that's a really easy way. 
that's, all, that's always the easy power move. Okay, you all can have all your rules for you, but in my area, we've got this, I've got this own set of, right? So I think there are incentives for people to do that, so I want to push back on, on the incentive they have. Um, and I also think that it is easy, frankly, for judges to think, um, I'm really smart, and this agency is a bunch of hacks, where this agency turns out describes almost every agency that they can think of, and so it's actually the it's the few exceptions that don't to, that that don't apply, um, and so I, as a general normative matter, I am I am sympathetic to the to the promise of Chevron, um, for honestly for some of the reasons that Chevron articulated in terms of in terms of democratic theory in terms of the distance that judges have the the lack of expertise, um, you know it's pick your poison right agencies will will screw it up sometimes judges will screw it up sometime. But we're going to have to give some significant authority to, to, to someone. So just to lay my own normative cards on the table, same kind of concern about the incentive. Incentive for judges makes your job more interesting if you don't defer. I get that. Incentive for um, exceptionalists makes your job more interesting if you get to say, I'm an exception or the rules don't apply to me. And, I, and I'm, I'm interested in pushing back on both of those normatively. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll say a few words on this. Well, I, I've argued separately that the I think the USPTO as a normative matter should get Chevron deference on subject matter eligibility, as I mentioned. I, I think you might wonder, because at least with the USPTO now not having uh, uh, infringement issues as, as part of its jurisdiction, the extent to which it should get um, uh, Kind of Chevron, Chevron level authority, uh, and to the extent its review of matters of say validity or patentability on issues like non-obviousness is tends to be much more cursory than you would get in litigation. And part of its administrative task is to try to figure out how to make this uh, um, job sort of digestible by its several thousand examiners you might be a little queasier about having it uh, determine the issues there. But I, I certainly think it's, it's something that uh, we, we can think as an enormous matter should be expanded. Um, I think Artie was right to emphasize, or in your question, you were right to emphasize that you know, my, my hold up here is really the first Mead question, which is uh, I think this key issue of what did Congress intend, did it really grant the authority to the USPTO? And that is where I think I have this elephant and mouse holes concern. Um, and where, uh, to go to something Chris said, I think the key difference, perhaps the most important difference with the Board of Immigration Appeals is, because there the court has said, uh, there's no question, clearly the Attorney General has Chevron level authority here. And then the, their key move was to say that that authority could be delegated and was delegated to the BIA from the Attorney General. Here, we're trying to do something significantly harder with the PTAP, which is to say, well, at least unless we overturn existing precedent, saying before the AIA, we didn't have Chevron level authority on these substantive questions. We're trying to say that the PTAB is creating, it's the, the generation of these proceedings and of the, P, uh, the new PTAB is creating this authority in the USPTO. So it, it's significantly harder uh, in, in that sense from, from, from my standpoint. Um, I think if the director and if these presidential proceedings, if we had something more of a hearing before the director, so the director, they've decided we're going to consider taking this case presidential. And then if the director invited briefing, I don't even think you'd have to have oral argument, but if you invited briefing, you'd have something much more like the standard formal adjudication setup, where the commission or the agency reviews things on the arguments. I think that would even make the case stronger. Uh, and I would, uh, well, I mean, it would think about maybe different issues, but I, I'd be inclined to be very sympathetic with the argument that that, uh, as a normative matter, should get uh, Chevron deference, at least to the extent you believe in the Chevron scheme in general. I was just going to briefly say, I mostly agree with John's perspective on this. Um, I am actually not a fan of strong federal circuit. I think that the PTAB has the technical expertise that the federal circuit judges do not. I am still apprehensive, though, about not having an internal level of appeal within the PTAB itself. Like, if there's some kind of a review of presidential decisions, then I'm great, and then I'm completely on board. Mm -hmm. 
but that's my one concern. But there is, right? I mean, doesn't the director have to sign off on any yeah. presidential opinion? Presidential opinions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so if we're going with the narrow argument that just the presidential opinions get Chevron deference, sure, you're, it seems okay. like a pretty. But, I don't know. I guess my standard administrative law is that when we could say the, the person who decides must hear, and so there, I think you would still want a hearing before. Yeah, uh, but that's not how it works in immigration, right? So the immigration, the attorney general has refer and review because authority. the idea is that the attorney general has delegated the authority by regulation. That was the Supreme Court reading, and the regulation says explicitly that the members of the BIA have the authority of the it's, attorney and, general. And there you have an immigration judge acting so, first and then going to the next. So, level. so just to clarify, both Sapna and John, you would agree that. If there was a rehearing before it was declared precedential, you'd be okay with that. You raised a due process question, and my view is, why isn't that due process issue, if there's a rehearing, just as relevant to the standard case where the director, or not the director, the, the agency head can reverse or affirm whatever the ALJ did? On, on any basis on at any all? On any basis at all, right. Um, well, because the sense was the director is working through the PTAP. So to create a shell PTAP <laughs> panel that's really the director seems to me to raise due process. Um, Anytime you're talking about James stacking, which is your term, James? a panel. What the chief so judge like the experts right. yeah. 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 would actually work. <laughs> <laughs> Some comment about the things you have written, but first, just some background that help might help uh, those of us listening to you better understand what you say and possibly to, uh, to impact how you're thinking about some of these things. First, just a point about relative expertise of the judges at the PTAB in comparison with, for example, district court judges. Now, actually, about 250 administrative patent judges, and that is the term by, by regulation and statute, administrative patent judges as opposed to um, administrative law judges. You'll note that the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board also has this creation of administrative trademark judges. Looking at those 250 judges and taking just the subset of judges who typically decide cases in the biotechnology area, let me offer you a profile that accurately describes about 12 of those 20 or so judges, so about 60% of them. The typical <coughs> profile of such a judge is one PhD in some subject like immunology, biochemistry, uh, um, any one of those types of subjects. Uh, two postdoctoral fellowships also in that area. Uh, one or two clerkships with an Article III judge in the federal system and 10 years of practice. <clears throat> It is hard to find, if you're bringing a biotechnology case in a district court, a judge with comparable background. And among other things, the impact of that is, for example, that a tutorial of the basic science applicable in the case almost always is unnecessary. Now, one thing that arises from having judges of that caliber making the decision is that they're not necessarily inclined to have a director, whoever that person, whomever he or she may be, to say, I don't like what you people decided when there are two or three of them. Now, quite apart from their liking it or not liking it, there is the fundamental due process question. I think about it at least in part this way. Would you hand a, a decision from one of our numbered regional circuits to the president and say, well, okay, the court decided this, but we, we want to appeal to your boss. Let him tell us whether or not uh, the decision is correct. Now, of course, the Article Three comparison is not entirely appropriate because we are talking an Article One administrative court. But the whole idea of due process is, I think, um, illuminated by looking at that comparison. Would you really, as a party in a case, say, okay, I'm before you judges, 
but ultimately we need to hear what your boss says as to whether or not uh, the decision will stand. Now, uh, of course, there are other agency parallel, other agency situations like the ITC, where by statute it goes for review to the agency. But that's not the case with PTAB decisions, which expressly by statute go to an Article III court for review. What happens in the real instance is that when a party loses, it requests rehearing. And the request for rehearing then enables the director of the agency, whose full title <coughs> is Under Secretary, United States Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Chief Advisor to the President for Intellectual Property and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trade Department, <laughs> <laughs> which encompasses a lot of territory. That request for rehearing then prompts the director and the chief judge of the board to decide whether the rehearing will be heard by the same panel, or whether the request for rehearing will be heard by the same panel or by uh, a different or expanded panel. Now imagine that you are one of the people who is eligible either to replace the panelist or to be added to the panel uh, that, uh, that already heard the case. And you have due process floating around in the back of your mind. And the director comes to you and says, I have questions about this decision. Let's decide the case in advance and then let's hear it. Clearly, due process is impacted in any system in which you would get the decision about the case before hearing the case and only decide to appoint to the case people who already have decided what the outcome should be. I have sat in meetings where the director has considered hearing a case or granting a request for rehearing or changing the panel so the request is granted, and where other people in the agency who might sit on the panel are in the same meeting. And the first thing that happens is this. They say, okay, if there's some chance that this might happen, let me now leave the room so that I have not predecided the outcome of a case. Because how can a case really be adjudicated by a group whose decision then can be trumped by people who have not heard the case but already have decided it. So I, that's one, just one other comment about the things you're discussing, broadest reasonable interpretation and the Quozo case. Uh, I attended the Quozo arguments uh, when they were heard at the PTAB, uh, reviewed and re helped revise the decision on circulation when it was there, went to the Quozo <coughs> argument at the Federal Circuit, participated with different people who are making the decisions about the government position on the case. Here's the really interesting, interesting thing about Quozo and Chevron deference and broadest reasonable interpretation. And this is a point that was made to me by one of the stellar judges on the PTAB by the name of Alan McDonald. One, one might think, well, okay, if one really wants to underscore the prime mover capability of the PTAB and also the uh, affirm Chevron deference as a procedural thing that, in, uh, that manifests itself with broadest reasonable interpretation, then what would happen is the Supreme Court would affirm the Federal Circuit's decision with regard to broadest reasonable interpretation being the correct interpretation. Here's another outcome that would make the, possibly make the PTAB even more of a prime mover. The Supreme Court says no broadest reasonable interpretation. The, the PTO does not have, it is not appropriate for the PTO to have a separate rule of interpretation of claims than the district court. What that would do is then make the PTAB standard for reviewing the claims of patents, those, those terms at the end of the patent which decide what its scope will be, it would make that exercise the same as between the PTAB and district courts. And inevitably, in cases where, uh, where the dispute is pending in both the PTAB and the Federal Circuit, or rather in, in the district courts, 
The PTAB would decide first because of the statutory timetable regarding these cases, which would make the claim construction that presides over the case probably both at the PTAB and the district court, one imposed by the PTAB, which would make its prime mover supremacy in the regulation of patents staggeringly large. And the amazing thing is uh, that the intention of Quozo in getting broadest reasonable interpretation struck is to minimize the deference given to the PTAB and a favor of a, a, net, a ruling that would seek to do that would actually have the opposite consequence if the people who were thinking about that really thought about the, the prime mover elements that I think Professor Golden's paper illuminates very well. Sorry, it took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, just on that one last point, and that is where Chevron and Brand X kick in. It's, they're really going to be the prime mover if, in fact, then their construction gets deference in the district court. The district court just says, oh, thanks for your construction. You know, it's, it's amusing you use your time that way. Now we're going we're, we're gonna to give this skid more deference, and it has no power to persuade whatsoever, then, then you're not a prime mover. And on that point, I, I, I can say that in the last two years, I've probably spoken to 50 district court judges who have said, uh, while they would never say that they would give, and shouldn't say as a matter of law, that they would give deference to the PTAB's uh, claim court construct or construction of the claims, they never want ever to get to that decision in their case without reviewing the PTAB decision on the claim construction if it is possible to do so. And what's their reason for that? Well, for example, in a biochemistry case, if they have a claim construction that has emerged from a, an adjudication involving three PhD biochemistry lawyers with law degrees who have clerked for them, they're not going to ignore that before proceeding to look at the issue themselves. Although, would that be true in the Eastern District of Texas um, with a judge who was not inclined to necessarily think the PTAB, you know, it wouldn't necessarily think the PTAB in a software case, say, was, was the be-all and end-all? I believe there's one district court decision from Texas in 2014 where the parties did not inform the judge about the progress of a parallel uh, PTAB case, mm -hmm. and the judge took the parties and their lawyers to task for the failure to notify the court of what was going on in the parallel proceeding. So, so I, I want to jump in and ask kind of a follow-up question. I, I, I love this. So if the standard's the same in the PTAB and in the district <laughs> court, would you think B&B hardware would apply here? To yeah. the same degree that you'd yeah. actually have issue and claim preclusion. I think actually issue preclusion. Issue. 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 Yeah. I mean, yeah, but the claim yeah. preclusion has already been established. Yeah, right, the right, same. right. The so I think B and B hardware does would apply if the standard were the same. So that would give the that would give the PTAB an enormous amount of power Huge. as a first mover. I, I think there's some problem with getting to claim preclusion too quickly for this reason. The claim construction question may present differently in the two matters. For example, if you have 10 claims at the back of the patent, it may be that the term which came to be interpreted was in the odd-numbered claims, and the ones that are present in the district court are in the even-numbered claims. Uh, so there wouldn't necessarily, by force of law, be claim preclusion. But for it not to be informative arising from the same document, that's hard to imagine that it would not be. But, if it's, if, it's, but if it's exactly the same claim, let's just say it's the same parties, same word, same claim. Are you going to say, Chris? Wouldn't that be wait, wait. Yeah, issue preclusion? Under B&B I mean, &B hardware, I think it would be. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I just want to take that step further. And B&B hardware is based on a story that talked about claim and issue preclusion being the presumption. So. It, it, would there be an argument to take it even further that if they didn't challenge the other claims before the PTAB, that they have now waived it because they could have? Just for the record, this is a well, this is a relatively recent case, this B and B hardware case, in which the argument was no, there can't possibly be Congress didn't intend it, can't possibly be um, issue claim, claim preclusion, and as Chris points out, of course says no, no, there can be actually, and there is here. I mean, I. I my sense is you'd have to read this in light of the statutory provisions on 
preclusion. Yeah, sure, so yeah. I think. I mean, I think I the court might come out differently that. because this is a different setup where they're forced, you know, but, but it's, I'm curious. It's, right. It'd be interesting to see. No, I mean, there's already an estoppel provision. Right. So they're, you know, in, in the, in the right. um, statute itself, there's an estoppel provision. So there is that issue as well. So let's take uh, more questions. Can I questions? see, uh, what, what is thing on the, on the due process league. So we all know um, ALJs in, say, the NLRB, um, have full trial hearings, and they and they ha and they hear from witnesses, and they have all this, and then it goes to the NLRB. And if you tell me who is the president of the United States at the point the NLRB is making its decision, I'm going to tell you what the outcome is going to be yeah. of that case. Yep. And none of us thinks there's a due process problem with that. We actually think that is central to democratic accountability. ALJs. Don't get to bind the agency. There would be a, a, an appointments clause problem if they did. And we don't actually have any illusions that the NLRB, they aren't taking any testimony. And we frankly don't have any illusions that they are really sitting there thinking of themselves as just being judges, or else it wouldn't every time be a 3 2 vote with the president's party winning 3 to 2. Anyway, sorry. You, you, I, I, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we can predict a lot of Supreme Court decisions based on the, the makeup of the we court can as well. Every but, NLRB but, decision. Yeah. <laughs> so the NLRB but, doesn't but, rehear. But there's also a lot less deference given to NLRB, NLRB decisions by the Supreme yeah. Court. I mean, there's I mean, Jim Jim Bredney has some great studies showing that right. the NLRB doesn't get Chevron deference. Absolutely. Uh, no, I was only talking about the due process yeah. point. I'm not talking about uh, the amount of I'm not talking about the due yeah. process yeah. point. Uh, Jonathan. decisions the PTO can create. The, the weird thing about that setup is that the fact of those decisions being presidential is a creature of yeah. internal PTO yeah. rules yeah. as opposed to statutes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I want to know what you think of that um, and whether, you know, so the, the implication I think of your argument is that agencies could sort of take a statute which provides for a, a certain set of procedures and then uh, by building upon them of their own accord, you know, create sort of a bootstrap themselves into Chevron deference or not. So I want to know sort of what you think the limitations of that argument are and why it, why it works here for Chevron deference and maybe doesn't work elsewhere. Um, and for John, I, I just want to very quickly, John, um, build on something that Safna said uh, about the Federal Circuit and Skidmore deference. And Safna said, well, you know, um, these results showing that Skidmore deference means something, those aren't for centralized courts. And so if I saw that it worked for the D.C. Circuit, maybe I'd be convinced it works for the Federal Circuit also. I, I guess I want to go a step further. I don't think that the D.C. Circuit thinks that it is the prime expositor of environmental law and that it knows better than the EPA what environmental law should look like. Whereas I do think that the Federal Circuit believes that it is the patent law and that it knows far better than the PTO or anyone else what patent law should look like and that the PTO's job is just to follow the Federal Circuit. So when I see sort of Skidmore in the Federal Circuit, I think that's going to be the Federal Circuit just continuing to ignore what the PTO does. And so I'm, I'm curious whether you are more optimistic about uh, Federal Circuit deference to PTO or not. Uh, so I'll, I'll go first on the, yes, yeah, so there is a bootstrapping issue, um, and John raises it in his article um, uh, with respect to why uh, internal procedure cannot create uh, a situation to which the uh, courts must give Chevron deference. That said, um, I'm not as, I suppose that for me as a normative matter, not as a descriptive matter necessarily, but as a normative matter, my view is that just as a comparative institutional competence matter, if you have an agency with the comparative institutional competence of the PTAB and its decision making has gone through the scrubbing that a presidential opinion has to go through, um, just as a comparative institutional competence matter, I don't see why there shouldn't be deference from the Federal Circuit. Um, now, that's not a descriptive a formal um, argument, um, but I'm not a formalist for the most part. So, you know, I don't think, I, I think, I don't think formal rejecting formalism leads us to like, you know, anarchy or something like that. It seems to me that we can make comparative institutional competence arguments. And Breyer has, in certain cases, applying when about regarding when meat should apply. He's basically said it's a comparative institutional competence question, and you probably disagree with that. But I don't think it's so crazy. Um, so, uh, well, 
I mean, comparative institutional competence can be viewed as you know, one, a factor, I think, under the meat analysis. But again, I, I, my hang up is really on this first issue of what, what Congress did. Uh, and the court, I mean, it's a different issue, but with regard to non-delegation concerns, the court has rejected this kind of bootstrapping approach where Scalia, in the opinion for the court, said there, even though the EPA has said it's not going to engage in uh, sort of wide-ranging cost-benefit analysis, the fact that the agency has restricted itself doesn't replace uh, uh, Congress actually having put that restriction uh, in, 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 into effect. On the federal circuit, I think I am more uh, optimistic. Um, you know, I might be wrong, but I, I am more optimistic. And you have seen the federal circuit, in certain situations, uh, invoke deference to the USPTO. A prominent one was the Ray Fisher case with the utility guidelines, where uh, the court there uh, invoked the sort of uh, USPTO's fact-finding related to the nature of express sequence tags and the, and the utilities that ha had been determined. Uh, and likewise, you've seen it in, in certain issues related to disclosure requirements in, in, in biotech, which goes partly to the expertise points that, that the, the former chief judge mentioned. So I, I don't think it's impossible, even with, and this is with the, quote, old federal circuit before we've had this major turnover, uh, and the new federal circuit judges, uh, as has been suggested, might be, uh, might be even, uh, as Sapna has suggested, might be even more likely uh, to, to defer. But it is, you know, it is a problem. It is a challenge where certainly Chevron uh, would give you a, a, a more secure uh, uh, reason to believe that you're going to get the kind of deference uh, on the issues where you think it's merited from, uh, from a normative standpoint. Uh, in the back. Um, so for you that don't know me, I'm a 2L. My name is Michael Pohl. Um, so my question has to do with some of the normative issues and the incentives the PTO has. So it's a little bit different from other agencies, as you might know, in that it's kind of fee-based. So the PTO might have an incentive to create substantive rules that are broader, uh, allow broader patentability so they get more maintenance fees. And then you have, like, in, you have like internal forces there, like the examiner's union, that might not exactly like rules that might result in the layoff of examiners because you're cutting back a lot of potential patents. So how do you think the PTO can best address that in trying to get substantive rulemaking authority? Good question for the next session. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I mean, bullet, yeah. no, no, I mean, I just would say, I mean, so I, I think what you're highlighting, and this is something that I think about, a lot of people I think, think about, is this question of, okay, are there structural incentives that might be pushing us in the wrong direction? So I've, I've suggested to you, I'm concerned about structural incentives, say, for judges, makes their job more interesting if they have, if they have more to do. And you're pointing out this is actually a structural incentive within the PTO to grant uh, too many patents. And by the way, maybe that has led to the, to the swing, or you all may know the famous case of um, the, uh, the attempted patent on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that were frozen with the, with the, with the crust. Um, and so I think, in fact, that is a pretty good argument for the PTAP. Um, that maybe, in, that maybe one of the, the reasons to have something like a PTAB is we might think that um, the PTO having said in many different contexts, oh, um, patent applicants are our customers, we might think has a slightly uh, too pat patent friendly in orientation. And so the question then is how do you structurally respond to that? That's one of the ideas behind the AIA in the first place. I know I'm putting the empty screen here. I created the, 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 uh, the, the AIA in, in 2011. So one argument um, more at a higher, slightly higher level of abstraction is, in general, administrative lawyers and, and law professors think that policy making through adjudication is not the preferred mechanism, even if you do have formal adjudication and all the bells and whistles. Um, so even if John would agree that everything that Mead requires applies, as a policy matter, people have said, well, formal adjudication is not the way to do policy making because it's case by case. It just replicates all the problems of policy making through the courts, through the Article III courts. But I think that there is a little bit of pushback to that because to the extent that you're concerned about capture, it's less likely to be a problem in formal adjudication than it is in rulemaking. And you know, capture is a problem for all agents. I don't think the PTO is unusual in having issues regarding capture. So I'll add a quick 
more anecdotal, so, uh, and obviously Michael and Melissa can answer your question more empirically, but you know, having litigated these patents cases, you all seen the USPTO video, the jury instruction video? No? You should look at it. It's crazy. And you always debate whether you want to ask the judge to do it or not, because it shows the USPTO and it talks about how they're this expert agency. And the idea there from a plaintiff's side oh, is, seen, yeah. yeah, the idea from the plaintiff's side is you want to like, you know, get this presumption of validity really out in front. The problem is when they show the examiner, her desk has a stack of patents this high on it, or applications this high on it, right? And she looks really tired. <laughs> and so, I, and, and I say that because I think the idea that it's a fee-based, you know, the, thinking of incentives as the agency is going to expand, you know, want to be more grant happy, you know, at least from a, I'm guessing she was kind of thinking also like, do I, you know, the, the contest here, the, the prize for winning this piting contest is more pie. Uh, if the, I'm not sure it actually plays out on the individual level that way. So that's way. also the yeah. so Michael and yes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm teeing this, this up more over the, yeah. the next panel. Yeah. The individual examiner versus the agency. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we are about out of time. You should, you should ask about James. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let the uh, chief judge have the last word. Break, so. Just three, three things very quickly. One, that video has been widely condemned. <laughs> <laughs> it's falling into increasing disuse, fortunately. <laughs> Presidential decisions, uh, yes, the presidential procedure is all a function of internal rulemaking for the PTAP itself and the director and not for, not beyond that standard operating procedures. Uh, they could go away tomorrow, in which case the whole discussion around what, how they might drive Chevron deference would change. Why have the procedure anyway? Well, you, you see at, at the various circuit courts of appeals and certainly at the federal circuit some panel variation which three judges decided the case. And the Federal Circuit as, and other circuits routinely deal with the matter of how do you get something that becomes the law of the circuit if you have different panels not necessarily bound by each other uh, deciding matters. Imagine that instead of having 12 factorial number of panels, <laughs> you have 250 factorial number of panels. How do you ever bring any kind of order to that system? Well, from time to time, certainly on very important matters, it's helpful to have a directive essentially voted on by the judges themselves that bind the judges themselves to some decision so that they're not wondering which of the several thousand different permutations of panels decided a case. And by the way, the, the answer to the question as to how many judges actually are working on AIA matters is that at any given time, it's about 40% of the total judge resource that goes to AIA matters. It's not 40% of the judges, it's probably 50% because some of the judges overlap in their responsibility. The work of those judges also is very coordinated so that any given panel, for example, is not operating geographically disparate. It is more often the case that a judge at one particular location is on a panel with judges at other locations, so it's a very integrated operation. Just as one last thing, I take some issue with the use of the word indulgent uh, review, I think, that appeared in one of the papers to describe the manner by which the Federal Circuit is reviewing uh, decisions of the PTAB taking an indulgent approach to the review of cases. Permit me to say in, in opposition, wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the first 28 cases from the AIA trials that went to appeal at the Federal Circuit, I think the Federal Circuit affirmed in full 24 of them and adopted essentially through the Rule 36 procedure every word of the decision by the, uh, by the PTAB. Some four or five other cases involved uh, not full affirmances and one case that was essentially an affirmance of the uh, procedure but not the actual outcome on an obviousness issue involved a reversal.
I don't think there's any trial court in the history of the Federal Circuit, and it would be hard to find any in any other circuit, I think, that went 24 for 26 in its first decisions where nearly all of the <coughs> cases had issues uh, of first impression being decided by the court. Do we really want to say the Federal Circuit was merely being indulgent and not really looking at the cases very carefully to determine in this seminal time in the history of these proceedings what the outcome should be? Personally, I don't think so. Please join me in thanking our panelists. That was great.